Okay, some hard acts to follow there. So um, I'm going to talk about robots and language, and specifically I'm going to talk about how humans and robots can interact and exist in the same space and how robots can be useful. So what is human-robot interaction? The sort of robots that we have right now tend to look something like this. Um, they're big, expensive, dedicated machines. They do these sort of large tasks. They do them very well. Um, and they operate in these dedicated spaces. So that's some robot arms putting a car together. And you can see that there's a cage around it because you do not want to get in the way of these robots when they're operating. Right? And perhaps the most painful thing about these robots is they can only really be operated by sort of heavily trained technicians. Uh, whereas what we want to see is something more like this. Robots that are doing things in a human environment, interacting with people, and doing what the people want them to do. Um, engaging in, you know, sort of outside a laboratory and industrial setting. So this raises some higher level questions for human-robot interaction. So if you think about it for a minute, you know, where will we start seeing robots? If you had a robot in your home, just take a sec to think about what would you want it to be doing? Would you want it to be doing laundry or dishes or keeping you company or helping with caregiving tasks? And these are the kinds of questions that human-robot interaction people have to ask themselves. Do we want our robots to be social agents or you know, agents that go off and do things in a corner when you're not paying attention to them, and at the end your laundry is folded? Or what exactly do we want? Do we want task-oriented robots? And practically speaking, how can humans collaborate with robots on a variety of tasks? How can they work together? And I ask that question because in order to have robots that are useful in human spaces, we really do need robots that are flexible and capable of interacting in a variety of sort of contexts. So here we've got a robot that's in the process of building a circuit with one of our students. And this is sort of the robot acting as a third hand, you know, for those tasks where you don't have quite enough hands to, to get in and hold all the different parts together and so on. But we don't want the robot to, we can't release a robot into a home that just builds circuits. That's not particularly useful. What we want is a robot that's capable of doing a variety of tasks based on what the human wants it to do, based on sort of what are the interaction styles. So how can these robots figure out what people want from them and what's going on in the world around them? And the answer to that is, one answer to that, is using language, using human language. And human language is you know, concise, it's intuitive, it's meaningful, you can convey a lot of different kinds of information with it, but it's also very difficult to deal with. It's ambiguous, it's you know, idiosyncratic, different people use language in different ways. So this is a very multidisciplinary kind of work. It's under the broad umbrella of artificial intelligence, how can, humor, how can computers do things that we usually think of as the province of humans. But it also requires machine learning because the robots need to learn about their environment and the world around them from the people that they're interacting with. And of course, it requires what's called natural language processing. How do we deal with English and other languages that people might want to use in their home to tell the robot what to do and interact with the robot? And here, we're considering and testing the use of language as an interactive sort of collaborative tool. Basically, we say that the robot understands the language if it does what a person, uh, if, uh, if it does what a person intends for it to do based on that language. And maybe that's not what understanding language really means. Maybe that's not true understanding. But for robots that are deployed in these kind of human settings, it's, you know, it's, it's what we want. And when we talk about this kind of language, I'm talking specifically about what's called grounded language, language that has meaning in and pertains to the physical world that robots engage in. And what I mean by that is language doesn't exist in a vacuum. If I say something like, put the LED in these two blocks of putty, or hand me my coffee mug, um, that language doesn't exist just sort of, I'm trying to understand it in the context of lots of other language. 
Uh, it, we understand things in context of the physical world that robots operate in. So if you want to teach somebody what an apple is, if somebody says, what's an apple, you don't lock them in the closet with a stack of dictionaries, right? You don't start by doing a bunch of explanation. You start by handing them an apple. And they you know, pick it up and move it around in front of their sensors, maybe you know, sniff it, squeeze it. And this is the kind of interaction that computers can't do, but robots can, because they have the sensors, they have the actuators, they have the ability to interact with the physical world. And given the proliferation of these really incredible technologies, things like ChatGPT and BARD, um, we might be asking ourselves, why do our robots need to learn from people? Uh, why can't we just pre-program them with the, the language that they need? And the answer is that the human world is really big and really dynamic. So I cook. How many of you cook? Probably, yeah, I see a lot of hands. So, you know, I expect if I go into somebody's kitchen, and you know, the home of a friend of mine, I expect to see a bunch of kitchen implements that I know what they are. But that's true 99% of the time. And 1% of the time, I encounter one of these things, right? And these are all standard cooking objects found in Western kitchens. Um, but they're just out there enough. They're just atypical enough that I don't know what they are. They're just atypical enough that we haven't pre-programmed a robot to know what they are. What we need is a human who can say things like, this is an olive scoop. Hand me the olive scoop. I need it to get olives out of a jar. And language is not only very physical, very meaningful in a physical, grounded context, but it's very multimodal. When people use language, we don't just use words. We use gesture, you know, we point to things, we look at things to convey that our attention is on them, we use body language. And robots have a lot of sensors beyond just vision. Robots have the ability to sense things like temperature and sound in the world around them. So real language learning for robotics, useful language learning, needs to take all of these factors into account. So for example, if I ask the robot to hand me my mug, the, you know, the fact that it can detect the things in the environment that are hot will give it additional information about what I might be talking about. And I'm going to show just a quick interaction with a robot. And what's important to know about this interaction is that it is not programmed. Everything the robot is doing in terms of trying to understand the, you know, the grad student pointing at things and talking about them is learned from interactions with people. So we had people come in and be like, all of these things are green. And the robot has to learn from that what the words mean, and what it is to be a pepper, and what it is to be an arch, and what it means to point at things. If I say, pick up this thing. You know, that's not completely trivial for a robot to do, but you can see that this robot has learned from those interactions and can do it. And one of the areas of research that my lab works on is the ethics of robots. So anytime you have new technologies, you have new risks. And some of those risks are very specific to these sort of physical objects in the world. They're different from the risks of just having robots or just having language technologies. If you've got a robot with cameras and sensors and the ability to understand what you're saying following you around your house, you should be asking privacy questions. You should be asking where that information is going and where it's being stored. You should ask whether these physical agents are trusted by the people around them? Are they sort of, do they have an inappropriate level of influence over the people they're interacting with? And how does that interact with questions of identity, the identities of the people using the robots and the identities that people place on robots? And that ties into questions, there's this robust conversation happening in machine learning right now about bias and diversity in human-robot interaction and in machine learning topics. So this is surfaced by things like robotic systems that don't recognize black faces in visual you know, recognition systems or don't recognize female voices for assistive technology. And my lab is working on questions of how can we deploy robots that don't have this kind of allocational harm. So that's some of the dangers. 
But robots can also have the potential to be really useful. They have the potential to be useful in assistive spaces, working with the elderly um, who want to remain in their homes for longer, or for, with people with disabilities. We want to reduce bias in interactions with machine learned systems in ways that we can support by having access to the physical world. We want new and improved machine learning methods and new ways of learning from robots in, for example, virtual reality. So broadly, learning grounded language is a complex problem. Um, there's a tremendous amount that goes into building a robot that can cook with you and you know, it, that can help somebody with medication, for example. And I hope this gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the goals of the work that's, that's uh, happening in my lab with some of my amazing collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention.